The desert can hold many secrets. The desert near Los Alamos in New Mexico just after World War II held perhaps the biggest secret of them all. May 21st, 1946. A top secret laboratory. A group of scientists look on as one of their colleagues, a Canadian named Louis Sloton, conducts a demonstration. Sloton hovers over a strange object which sits on display on a small table in front of the crowd of onlookers. The object looks like a metal sphere nested inside a more substantial metal hemisphere like an egg in a nest. But this metal device contains a terrifying potential. Why? Because it's nothing less than the exposed core of a nuclear bomb, and the egg at the center is an orb of pure plutonium. Imagine being in that room. You probably could have heard a pin drop, such was the intense atmosphere. Sloton's demonstration was a risky one. The operation he was performing had an ominous nickname among the group. They dubbed it, quote, Tickling the Dragon's Tail. The Dragon's Tail. This is a delicate procedure, whereby the core is brought to the point of critical mass. This creates a chain reaction of the weapon's inner material, which becomes self-sustaining. The researchers at the Los Alamos lab had been conducting these types of experiments in secret for years to observe and stretch the limits of nuclear capability. The potential, not to mention the sheer danger, of chasing this dragon's tail was immense. Sloten was poised over the exposed core. In his left hand, he held a half shell of beryllium over the core, leaving just a sliver of empty space between the core's surface and the beryllium. In his right hand, he held a simple screwdriver. Why the screwdriver? Simply to use its flathead tip to ensure the small sliver of space remained between the two components. It was a demonstration Sloten had performed many times before. It had become a sight so routine at the lab that one of his colleagues watching on, a certain Raymer Schreiber, turned away to look at other work. He just assumed there would still be some time before anything notable happened. But no one, not even Schreiber, could have anticipated what happened next. As Sloten continued to slowly lower the beryllium, the screwdriver slipped in his right hand. The beryllium hemisphere dropped, making full contact with the exposed core. The dragon was awake. A flash of bright blue light tore through the lab, accompanied by a blast of heat. Within moments, the scene descended into chaos and terrified panic. The Manhattan Project. The laboratory in Los Alamos was part of a more extensive operation conceived by the U.S. government as a way to harness the full power and potential of nuclear weapons on the eve of the U.S.'s entry into World War II. It was given the code name the Manhattan Project, perhaps the most famous code name for any project in military history. The Manhattan Project was established in 1941 with the approval of then-President Franklin D. Roosevelt. The project was composed of and led by American scientists with support from the United Kingdom and Canada, and under the supervision of Major General Leslie Groves. Its true visionary, though, was the nuclear physicist Robert Oppenheimer, who had been the director of the operation's primary facility, the already mentioned Los Alamos Laboratory, from 1943 to 1945. The lab was conceived as a remote facility where the project's researchers could conduct their work in a safe, secret, and secure environment. Oppenheimer had recommended searching the remote deserts outside of Albuquerque, New Mexico, where he himself owned a ranch. The project settled on the Los Alamos location because of its natural beauty, hoping it would inspire scientists to come and work there. It was at the Los Alamos lab, in the shadow of the pristine Sangre de Cristo Mountains, where the world changed forever. On July 16, 1945, in the Jornada del Muerto Desert in southeast New Mexico, Oppenheimer and several other Manhattan Project scientists gathered to observe what would be called the Trinity Tests. A new type of plutonium weapon would be tested, the very first of its kind. Its detonation would rely on an implosion in which criticality would be achieved by surrounding explosives within the weapon's casing. This, in turn, would implode or literally squeeze out the plutonium core at the center. It was Oppenheimer's idea to test the implosion device in New Mexico, arguing that, quote, the implosion gadget must be tested in a range where the energy release is comparable with that contemplated for final use. If it were unclear what Oppenheimer was referring to when he said final use, it would not be for long. The next month, on August 6, 1945, a simple gun-type atomic bomb, codenamed Little Boy, was dropped on Hiroshima, Japan. The weapon used a crude detonation technique, 
in which a core of uranium-235 was fired into a second uranium core. Three days later, on August 9th, a more complex weapon, using the same plutonium core-based design as the one detonated in the Trinity test, was dropped on Nagasaki, Japan. This bomb, codenamed Fat Man, killed over 100,000 people and effectively forced Japan's surrender to the Allies. The deadly duo, known as Fat Boy and Little Man, together changed the course not only of a war, but humanity itself. And not necessarily for the better. The Demon Core Otto Robert Frisch was an Austrian physicist who fled from Nazi Germany to Western Europe, where he became a specialist in nuclear fission. Frisch eventually worked as part of the British delegation at the Manhattan Project, before finally moving to the United States and joining the team at Los Alamos in earnest. Frisch's primary responsibility while at Los Alamos was overseeing the research and development of enriched uranium weapons, like the type that would be used in the Little Boy bomb over Hiroshima. But his other major work in his time at the lab was leading the Critical Assembly Group, which included, among others, Harry Daglian and a man already introduced, a certain Louis Slotin. Frisch was responsible for the conceiving of the Dragon's Tail experiment. His Manhattan Project colleague, Richard Feynman, noted the danger involved with the procedure and came up with the phrase tickling the dragon's tail to insinuate that if anything went wrong, it would be like waking a sleeping dragon. The first two plutonium cores developed by the Manhattan Project, the historic first core used in the Trinity test, and the second, which was detonated over Japan, received the bulk of the attention. But the project actually produced three plutonium cores at the cost of over $500 million each. And that was in 1940s dollars. The third core, originally given the nickname of Rufus, had been built as insurance. It was intended to be used as a third weapon against Japan if needed. But with the war ending, the third core did not have an immediate military purpose. So Rufus was thus kept safe and secure at Los Alamos to be used further in their research and experimentation when so needed. However, in a tragic turn of events, the core did end up living up to its destructive purpose. In its time at Los Alamos, it took the lives of two scientists and was given a new, more fearsome nickname as a result. The Demon Core. The Tickle. The first scientist to fall victim to the Demon Core was a 24-year-old scientist named Harry K. Daglian Jr., who joined the team at the Los Alamos lab in 1944 while still a graduate student. On the afternoon of August 21, 1945, just two short weeks after the Nagasaki bombing, Daglian was performing a criticality experiment involving the Demon Core. He was trying to construct a neutron reflector. This work involved placing 10-pound bricks of tungsten carbide by hand around the plutonium core to see what number of bricks and in what arrangement would cause the core to go into critical mass. The neutron reflector would theoretically reduce the mass required to allow the bomb to reach criticality. And yes, he was doing this so-called bricklaying using his hands. Daglian performed the operation that afternoon more or less successfully. He had brought the core close enough to criticality to end the experiment there. However, Daglian wanted to push it further. He returned to the lab alone that night and repeated the steps. He laid out the bricks around the core as he had that afternoon and prepared to try adding one more to the arrangement. But as Daglian moved the final brick into place, the neutron readers monitoring the experiment gave off a code red alert. If Daglian placed the last brick, the core would overperform and reach a supercritical mass. This meant that once the chain reaction started, it would become uncontrollable. Daglian, in a panic, pulled his hand holding the brick quickly away, but in doing so, he inadvertently dropped the brick directly over the plutonium. The demon core, already in a near-critical state, went supercritical. In nuclear jargon, going supercritical is never a good thing. Similar to the earlier description of Louis Slotin's accident, there was a flash of blue light and an explosion of hot air. Daglian recoiled, but he managed to knock the errant final brick off the core and onto the ground in the process. In doing so, however, he received a fatal dose of radiation from the demon core. Twenty-five days after the accident, the scientist fell into a coma and died. He was the first official fatality from a criticality accident. In the hospital, Daglian would slowly succumb to the radiation taking hold of his body. He was visited by several of his Manhattan Project colleagues. Louis Slotin, his peer in the Critical Assembly Group in particular, was a constant presence at his bedside. Just seven months after Daglian's accident, Slotin 
would become the second physicist to be claimed by the Demon Corps. It happens again. When Louis Sloten himself slipped in the lab May 21st, 1946, everyone in the room knew instantly just how dire the situation was. Sloten had managed to flip the beryllium orb away from the core, but as in Dadlian's accident, the damage had been done. After recovering from the shock of the reaction, the blue flash and the extreme heat, one of the scientists called an ambulance. The monitoring equipment in the room calculated the number of reactions from the event at three quadrillion, over a million times smaller than the atomic bomb detonation, but still a fatal amount of radioactivity to release into the room. Sloten, confused and agitated, began to take readings of various objects in the room to get a sense of the amount of radiation they had absorbed. He read an empty glass bottle, a hammer, a measuring tape. That's how disoriented he was. Ironically, the detector itself had also been hit with the blast, and its readings were useless. The lab was evacuated, and the ambulances arrived. All of the scientists present for the experiment were taken to the Los Alamos hospital for evaluation. Sloten, the man closest to the core at the time of the reaction, was in the most obvious danger. He vomited once before arriving at the hospital, and several times again over the following hours. His health at first seemed somewhat stable, though it quickly deteriorated for the worse. His left hand, the one holding the beryllium and the part of his body closest to the core, became extremely painful and eventually became blue and lifeless, covered in welts and blisters. It was estimated that his hand had been exposed to over 15,000 rem of x-rays, a catastrophic amount. Sensing that there would be no recovery, Sloten's parents flew into New Mexico from their hometown of Winnipeg, Canada. By the time they arrived, his body was failing rapidly. His white blood cell count had dropped severely, along with his temperature and heart rate. The internal damage to his organs and tissue created extreme nausea and constricting pain, the result of what one of his doctors called, quote, a three-dimensional sunburn. The Demon Lurks. Louis Sloten would die nine days after the horrific incident in that Los Alamos lab. Three of his colleagues remained hospitalized after his death, though all three ultimately survived. Alvin Graves, the next man closest to the core after Sloten, lived the rest of his life with chronic neurological and vision issues before succumbing to a heart attack at the age of 55. As a result of the deaths of Sloten and Daglian, the criticality experiments at Los Alamos were put on indefinite hold. The work had always been dangerous, and the scientists knew the risk of working with such unstable and hazardous materials. However, the U.S. military did them no favors by placing such immense wartime and post-war pressure on their productivity. With World War II behind them, the military could no longer justify the potential human cost of such highly dangerous work, even with a new enemy in the guise of the Soviet Union. The safety protocols and regulations were looked at with a newly skeptical eye, and a special committee was created to evaluate all future experiments. It was agreed that, going forward, remote controls and mechanical arms would be used to allow scientists to keep a distance from nuclear materials. As observed in Sloten's experiment, even a few feet of distance could make all the difference. Surely this should have been self-evident to men as brilliant and well-educated as these men were. The Demon Corps itself had been slated to be detonated as a demonstration in front of thousands on Bikini Atoll, a remote outcrop of land in the Marshall Islands in the South Pacific. But after Sloten's death, the test was cancelled due to both the surprising power of the Pacific detonations and the Demon Corps' lingering radioactivity. The Demon Corps was unceremoniously melted down and recycled to lurk in a new series of unidentified cores. <laughs>